It's October 22, uh, 2013. Um, we're in Sukkot, second day. Our dear Heavenly Family, once again, we want to thank you and thank you for bringing us here together. Thank you that we can be here and fellowship with each other and enjoy this feast of Thanksgiving and that we can learn the things that you've given us in your scriptures. And we thank you just so much for all of this. Such a wonderful welcome. I want to ask again that your presence be with us. I want to ask that uh, each person's mind be opened more and more and open to the truth, open to you. And that we take the truth and, you know, see it as it really is and accept it not just as a theory, not just as a new doctrine to proclaim, so that we understand it and live it as a, a true reality, as the only true reality. And that in that we receive from you justification by faith and the strung up in activity going forward and this reformation that we've been longing to bring about for so many years that it be finally accomplished. And in that, we want to ask that your kingdom come and will be done in earth as it is in heaven. So thank you so much. And thank you for bringing this thing about, bringing about the establishment of your kingdom in its beginnings, human sprouting the wilderness, and we ask that you grow and flourish in that as many souls as possible can be saved. Mm-hmm. All this falling will be saved in me, the branch, in you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. So, what we will be uh, starting with here is, we'll be starting, we were talking this morning, for those of you who weren't here, a little bit just about prayer, and we just kind of want to finish that up, if we can wrap that up with a, a couple other things, and then from that point, it will be our purpose to go into looking more at wisdom in Proverbs, and we already kind of introduced the Apocrypha, so we we might look at uh, the wisdom of Solomon some more. But we're going to start with prayer, and because we've been praying to our Heavenly Family, and uh, some ask, you know, well, you know, are we supposed to be praying to our Heavenly Family? Because Christ said, you know, our Father, which are in heaven, so aren't we to pray to our Father? And there's a debate in Christianity, even aside from this discussion and what we've been learning here, if we're to pray to Jesus or not. You know, there's a lot of people who say, no, we're supposed to just pray to the Father in the name of Jesus, right? And so we're going to look at this and just what is prayer. This morning, what we went and looked at is how in the Bible there's many places that, and we gave some examples, there's many more. We found out that we have a heavenly family, that's what we've been studying here. And the idea of praying to our Father, and how does that work with this? So we looked at a number of places that talk about, you know, the prophets and the patriarchs praying to Elohim, which we saw as plural, both in number and in gender. So they're praying to Elohim, and then there's also, we looked at First Kings chapter 8, where Solomon prays to Eloah, or Elohim, you know, my or goddess of, it's a possessive form of or goddess, goddess of Israel. So he's been there. We didn't look at a number of places in Job, but if Job is actually the highest concentration in the scriptures of the word Elah or Eloah. It's just goddess. There's a lot, and there's a lot of El Shaddai, and there's a lot of the word Ruach. There's a lot of feminine terminology in the, in the book of Job. And so, here we have just things of, okay, it looks like prayer is broader than just to our Father. Now, the people might say, well, then why did Jesus give that as the example? Well, the thing is that they were asking him, right, how should we pray? What he was answering, many people take it, and there's a lot of people who take the Lord's Prayer and recite it every day as their prayer. Now, 
if you really look at Christ's intention in that, his intention was to bring them beyond ritual, beyond formality, to a real conversation. That's why he starts off saying, our Father, right? Our Father. He doesn't say, you know, O oh, King of the vast, incomprehensible universe. You know, he says, our Father. He said, not my Father, but our Father as well. In other words, he is relating to his Father personally, but he's including us in that to say, our Father. And what he says isn't, he wasn't saying it to be a particular liturgy, that this is to be our prayer every day, these particular words. It's that this is an example of how we are to personally relate with our Father in heaven. Now, saying our Father has implications with it in regards to other things. We, we talked about the implications of if there's a Heavenly Father, that by necessity of the term father itself, there must be a heavenly mother, because one cannot be a father except the means of a mother. So that's just an implication there. So it's not necessarily excluding the concept of mother, because the example that Christ gave is father. Now, what we're going to do now is look at a few scriptures that address the issue of praying to Jesus. Um, and then we're going to discuss what the purpose of prayer is and what prayer is really all about. So I'll just uh, get a couple of scriptures here. Um, first, there's you know there's a number of scriptures. There's actually a video that I have on YouTube uh, called "Should We Pray to Jesus?" and it's a pretty short video, um, but it is you know addressing this very subject. We won't go through all the verses that we have there. Now, but we'll just look at probably just two verses. There's more. And also, if you look up in Ellen White's writings, just look up on the CD-ROM, pray Jesus. Just those two words together, you'll see that she talks about praying to Jesus. Yes, you know, it's like she's assuming when you read the writings all, that is something that we all do. You know, she talks about how we should be praying to Jesus. So, uh, first verse is Revelation 22, verse 20. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely it come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. So John there, who is he talking to? Lord Jesus, right? He says, Even so, come, Lord Jesus. He's talking to Jesus and saying, Come. Now, in that, it's addressed to Jesus. Jesus had already been crucified and resurrected. He wasn't on earth at that time. He was in the heavenly sanctuary. And um, he's talking to Jesus. You know, so what is that? We talked this morning, we talked a little bit about the word pray. And how the word pray is really an old English word that means to ask. That's all that, that means. However, our discussion with our heavenly family is supposed to be more than just asking them. Where we can discuss everything with them and we should discuss everything with them. So here, you know, he says, come Lord Jesus. That is a request. He's asking them to come. So that is by definition of prayer. Come, Lord Jesus, or address the news. There's many other examples, but uh, we'll look at one more from, uh, let's see, John 14. John chapter 14, verse 14. Now, the way that this is translated sometimes is uh, a little bit different uh, in translation to translation. But there's been... Pardon? John 14, 14. And then if you can actually look it up in any other translation as well, you'll see how it's uh, worded slightly differently. Um, and there's been, you know, you can look whether it's on... A website like this, a Bible Gateway, or if you scroll up, there's a translation slot. Right. I think I would go there's, to a different one, because this has all kinds of pop ups Yeah, go to uh, Blue Letter Bible, or that's what it is, Blue Letter Bible. That Blue Letter Bible is a good resource online. If you don't have your own Bible software, and it'll show you the Greek text and the Hebrew text, what it commonly use. 
And so um, if you look this up on a website like this, you'll be able to look at the different users and see what it says. All right, so if you, uh, yeah, John 14.14 and click, I don't know, ESD or something like that. ESD is actually a fairly good translation. Some translations like the uh, NIV and others aren't really that good. It's more of a paraphrasing language. ESV is English Standard Group. Yeah. So, John 14, 14, if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. In the King James, it just says, if you ask anything in my name. In the actual Greek text and in most translations, it translates more accurately to say, if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. To ask is to pray, right? So if you ask me or if you pray to me anything in my name, I'll do it. That's what Jesus is saying. There. So that's just a couple of scriptures. There's more. You guys can check out the video. It should be pray to Jesus if you like, or we can discuss more after how we should be praying to Jesus. Now let's just think about this for a second. We all talk about knowing Jesus as our personal Savior. Right? How are we supposed to know Jesus if we don't talk to him? You know, doesn't quite make sense. In order to know someone, you need to be in dialogue. You need to be in communication. So that's what, what we typically call prayer is really about. We're supposed to be in communication with our heavenly family. So, in other words, if it's true, and the re only reason why I put it in a hypothetical is just for those who are investigating this and may not be fully persuaded, and I believe each needs to be fully persuaded in their own minds. Um, if it is true that we do have a heavenly family, of a father, mother, son, and daughter, then they really want to get to know us. And as we study and look more at who they are, it becomes more and more evident at how much they want to know us as individuals. And in order to really know them, we need to be talking to them. Right? So every time we talk to them, it's not that we always have to say our family or whatever it may be. Sometimes we, we might want to just talk to Jesus, just like we see in some of these scriptures. Sometimes we might just want to talk to our father or the other comforter, the Holy Ghost. You know? And there's just, we need to understand that there are real people who want real relationship, not just a form. So that's why we pray to our Heavenly Family because we're talking to them and thanking them because, you know, it's just natural that if our sister is the one who gives us life, wisdom is a tree of life, it's natural to want to thank her personally. So um, it's just a natural thing to want to talk to those who are blessing us and thank them and ask them things since we know that that's their particular role to do, you know, to do a certain thing. We can ask them of that ask our mother for comfort and so on. So hopefully that makes sense and if there's a need to discuss this more later we can. But, sure. Sure. Um we should never think that one of them would be hurt or offended because we're not talking to them. Maybe one day we want to talk to our mother specifically or our sister specifically or whatever. They're all selfless. Exactly. There is no contention or jealousy between any of them. Mm -hmm. And truly, when we pray to one, we pray to all anyway. And so if if we, in one conversation, speak more directly to one of them than the other, the other ones are not going to be thinking, why are they talking to me? Yeah. There's none of that. There's none of that selfishness in us. Exactly. Not, definitely not going to be jealous. However, your child um, is a child to come and communicate to me. Uh, or I'm going to immediately communicate to my wife and mother. Exactly. It's going to be shared. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And of course, the the child is going to be, if a child, you know, or a child, any child, loves two people, they're going to be talking to both of them, you know. Even though there is that sharing, you know, we're, it's good for us to know each each member in our heavenly family as individuals and collectively as right? So then there is one other aspect actually that we want to address, the aspect of at the end praying in the name of the draft. What's what's that whole thing about? Now so we're gonna just kind of address that briefly 
Um, there are other studies that address it probably in more detail than we'll go into, but we want to look at something that Ellen White in Early Writings, page 15, her first vision is recorded. This is also in the Words of Little Law, page 14. And she talks about the 144,000. And she says, I saw the 144,000. They were all sealed and perfectly united. And they had written on their foreheads, God, New Jerusalem, and a glorious star containing Jesus' new name. And people are like, what? Jesus' new name? You know, at Seventh-day Adventist, that's something that is little if ever spoken of. Among Davidians, that's something that is little if ever spoken of. A glorious star containing Jesus' new name. Now, people might say, well, where does that come from, right? How is how come Ellen White is saying that Jesus is going to have a new name? And why is that part of her first vision? That should be something of significance. The first vision that God chose to give Ellen White she talks about that. And in part, the other thing that should lend significance to that is it's part of the seal of the 144,000. They have written on their foreheads, God, New Jerusalem, and a glorious star in Jesus' new name. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 12, uh, we have a passage there from which this concept is taken. Revelation chapter 3, verse 12. To him that overcometh, will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. And I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. Right? So Jesus there tells us that he will have a new name. Right? Uh, a lot of times today, there's controversy of whether or not we call Christ. Jesus, or Yeshua, or Yehoshua, or Yahshua, or there's a million other, you know, that's exactly what it is. So there are dozens, I'm sure, of different pronunciations. Yeshaya, and there's so many different pronunciations, and people debate heavily over this. Now, we can agree whether we disagree on the, how the word Jesus came into history and so on. We can agree that he was originally called but most people would pronounce Yeshua or something like that. And that is how John knew him, right? But he said to John, and John reported, that he will have a new name. So his original name was, what do you want to say, Jesus or Yeshua or Yeshua or Yehoshua, whatever it may be, he says, I will have a new name, right? So, according to Adam Light, this is some sort of truth that the 140,000 will understand. How do we know that? What does it mean to be sealed? Judged. Judged. Okay. Settling into the truth. Both. Mm -hmm. Settling into the truth. Purification. Right. Yeah, there's purification. There's sealing and purification of the truth. Now, the name is in the book of life. And your name and your sins become blotted out. And there's a whole lot of things that go along with sealing. Ellen White talks about sealing as a settling into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually. In other words, you understand it in your mind. Some people could say that's the theory of the truth. But you actually have the experience of it in your life, spiritually. A lot of times we use the word spiritual to denote something that is immaterial or some spiritual realm. We'll be looking at, yeah, ethereal, yeah. We'll be looking at what the word spiritual and spirit actually means. And I'll just state at this point that what it has to do with is life and life given that which is alive, full of life, that which is spiritual. So they understand it intellectually and spiritually. They have it as a living thing to them, right? So, if that is sealing, and part of what we are sealed with is Jesus' new name, then it must be that Jesus' new name is a truth that we must settle into intellectually and spiritually, right? So, I just, I'll just i kind of recap something here. We have those three parts to the seal that's mentioned in the Bible. 
God, New Jerusalem, and Jesus' new name. We kind of briefly touched on this yesterday, I believe. The seal of God, Adventists have understood, and Ellen White tells us that the seal of God is the Sabbath seal. Now, the seal of New Jerusalem, New Jerusalem is talking about the kingdom, the kingdom and the ministry, because Jerusalem is used many times throughout Scripture as a symbol for the ministry. That's why there's calls to Jerusalem. It's not talking to the city, it's talking about the ministry, the leadership. So we have a new ministry, a new leadership, a new Jerusalem, which Hoth talks about as 140,000. And his whole message was to call for reformation and bring the truth of the 140,000 and the establishment of the kingdom. He brought that seal of the new Jerusalem. But after Victor Hoda, there's this other part which neither Ellen White nor Hoda explained. Jesus' new name. That's also part of the seal of the 140,000. Now, it was mentioned here about what about this glorious star? That is another aspect that's kind of an aspect of hidden nana, because it doesn't mention the glorious star in Revelation when Jesus talks about his new name. However, Ellen White in her first vision says, God, New Jerusalem, and a glorious star containing Jesus' new name. So what's this glorious star about? And if you read the study on the back table, it's very cool. It's the four horns of the altar of the sanctuary. It goes into explaining what that is. So we have this aspect of Jesus' new name. So what we're going to do right now, and this is an important thing to understand, what is Jesus' new name? Go ahead. Um, uh, this is um, to, about the star, is that what is that statement? Yes. Uh, don't talk about that. They never explain what it is, and Ellen White just mentions it as though it's just part of the text. God, New Jerusalem, and a glorious star containing Jesus' new name. However, the glorious star part, it's not here. Right? It's not in Revelation 3 when Jesus talks about this. So the question is, what is that about? So that's explained in the study at the back, Four Horns of the Altars of the Sanctuary. Go ahead. I always carry it in my Bible. I always carry it in my Bible, too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then I carry more of my Bible. Case, um, it says that the star is written in the Bible, New Jerusalem, and, and so God, which God name was it? Hmm. Which, which God name? Was it? Oh, which God? Well, the name which is there from the Sabbath is Yahweh, and that is, as we have seen, a reference to a whole heavenly family. But she talks about Ellen White goes into explaining, and the early Adventists um, wrote a lot about how we know that that seal of God is the seal of the Sabbath truth identifying our creators and identifying the lawgiver, right? So that's that's how we know it's the Sabbath seal. And there's a lot of studies, a lot of studies written by Benjamin Rodin, uh, starting from the 1950s, where he goes into explaining that in a lot more detail and paralleling the three, God, New Jerusalem, Jesus' name, and giving a lot of explanation as to each and how we know what each represents. So, yeah, the glory star, that's found in early writings, page 15, and words of little plot, page 14. There is also, to look into this, that's, Ellen White clearly speaks of it, Revelation clearly speaks of it, Jesus having a new name. Now, Jesus' new name will be revealed, of course, as we've seen, since it's part of the seal of 140,000, it should be revealed in the time in which the 140,000 are to be sealed, right? So that should give us an indication of when we should learn of Jesus' new name. Now, where there's no type, there's no truth. We've heard these concepts. In the Bible, there are types for the time of the sealing of the 140,000. One type that should inform us of something is found in the prophecy or prophecies of the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem that we see in Zechariah and Haggai. Now, we also have this concept that we should be able to look and learn something 
um, from a statement that Ellen White makes in Acts of the Apostles, page 585, where she says, all the books of the Bible meet and end in the Revelation. Victor Hodd explains the seven years of plenty and the seven years of famine that happened with Joseph to be a type explaining to us that uh, seven seven years is a complete period of time. And the seven years of plenty, seven years of famine are covering the history of the world. And the seven years of plenty are teaching us the lesson that all the truth, all the grain, grain is a symbol of truth at times in the Bible, is put into the storehouse before Joseph came in seven years of, uh, or before the seven years of famine begun. But which Acts of the Apostles? Acts of the Apostles, page 585, says, 85? yes, 585, mm-hmm. says all the books of the Bible meet and end in the Revelation. So when we look at Revelation, we can see that everything found there should be found somewhere else in the Bible. So um, we have this concept. Uh, other people who don't know of Ellen White, also some scholars and so on understand that concept because they found that I think 90-some percent of the book of Revelation is direct allusions to Old Testament prophecies. So this is something that's known. Now, we have the type of seven years of plenty, seven years of famine, where a lot of explains that everything in the New Testament is only a revelation of what's in the Old Testament. So what we find in the book of Revelation is going to be found in the Old Testament. Now, there are certain things that were hidden or not understood in the Old Testament prophecies. The New Testament is to help us understand what that is. So in the Old Testament, somewhere, it should talk about some name that Jesus is to receive. Now, in the Revelation, what it is explaining is that that is Jesus' new name. So when we go back and we see there's a type of the ceiling of 140,000 found in Zechariah's prophecies. Now, the reason why we know that's a type, I won't go into it, into it in detail. Victor Hodes uh, takes some time to explain this. The early Christian church was typified by Solomon's temple. You read the book of Ephesians and elsewhere in the New Testament where it talks about becoming lively stones and built up a house and so on. And it talks about the stone which the builders refused, referring to Christ. The stone which the builders refused was part of Solomon's temple. And Christ was refused at the time of the early Christian church. And that's how the New Testament writers applied it. So, Since they applied the first temple as a type of the early Christian church, Zechariah talks about these two brass mountains. The first one we saw is the same thing as that temple. But there's a second one. That is what the second temple was pointing forward to. And that's why when we've been reading from Zechariah in chapter 2, chapter 8, chapter 6, chapter 14, all these places, we see these prophecies haven't been fulfilled and it's clearly, by comparing Scripture to Scripture, prophecies of the last days. So the church in the last days is typified by Zechariah's vision. The church in the last days is the church whose leadership is the 144,000. So, in other words, that's just to read some or explain a little bit of the idea that we can find the truth that the 140,000 should learn to be part of their seal in the types of Zechariah's vision. Now, let's go to Zechariah chapter 6, and we're going to read verses 12 and 13. It says here, And speak unto him, and the him there is referring to Joshua the high priest, Speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh Yahweh of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch. And he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear the glory, and shall sit and rule upon his throne, and he shall be a priest upon his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. So, notice that according to Zechariah's vision, there's a man whose name is 
the branch. Now, this man is the one to build the temple and bear the glory and do all these things. And it emphasizes, notice it says twice, once at the end of verse 12, once at the beginning of verse 13, he shall build the temple, even he shall build the temple. It's emphasizing. When it's talking about the new name in Revelation chapter 3, what does Christ say? What does Jesus say? He says, to him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. So according to Revelation 3, Christ is the one to build the temple. According to this passage, the branch, the man who is named, not just the title, whose name is the branch, shall build the temple. Right? We know from other prophecies, like Isaiah chapter 11, where it talks about a rod coming forth from the stem of Jesse, and a branch proceeding from his roots, that the branch is a symbol of Christ. Jeremiah 23, verses 5 and 6, says, And I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper. Right? So we see that the branch is clearly Jesus, you know. And it's also in uh, Luke chapter 2, I believe, or Luke chapter 1, I'd have to check, verse 78, uh, there's a name that's given to Jesus, or talks about Jesus, and the marginal reading tells us that he shall be called the branch, right? And so, yes, that's from the Old Testament. So, yes, I didn't actually, I could get the actual verse for you right now if you want, just to uh, have something from the New Testament that specifically addresses Jesus. It is Luke chapter 1, verse 78. It says in the regular text, the column reading, it says, Through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us. The marginal reading in the King James says, Through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the branch from on high hath visited us. So, you know, Christ is clearly referred to as the branch. There's also uh, the prophecy that Matthew talks about that he will be called a Nazarene. Well, there's no prophecy that specifically says he'll be called a Nazarene. However, the word Nazarene is just an English kind of way of saying Netzarene or Netzar, Netzir which is the word for branch. And that's what Isaiah 11 says, that he'll be the nectar, the branch. Also the account is of the third one. Okay. And then the same thing when Elijah was telling them why you're walking in two opinions, why you're walking in two branches. Okay. Okay. I'll just, Tim was just hearing that, you know, Elijah, when he's talking about why haul you between two opinions, why haul you between two branches. And there's, there's this, uh, this whole thing with the two branches where there's always a counterfeit. You see, yeah, a degenerate branch of a branch. In French, it means seed. That's interesting. That's interesting. Christ is also called a seed. Yeah. Seed. Yeah. That's what she was pointing out. In French, it means seed. So that's what it's Well, we'll get into, into that. There's actually as far as the history of the branch in terms of where it is, there's there's things, this is something that goes back to almost every ancient religion so far as I'm aware, where they had this figure of God the Son, even Tammuz, which was a pagan god, and he was the son of Semiramis, and Tammuz means branch. So it's, a, it's an interesting thing how there's this counterfeit, and there's even constellations where you have, uh, I think it's the Virgin and the Branch, and I don't remember all the, the particulars with the constellations, but it's, um, at least in the Isaiah 11 context, it's the symbol of a tree, right? The symbol of a tree. Go ahead, Lorna. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And actually, it's, Ezekiel is coming to my mind, too, Ezekiel 8. I'll just mention, Lorna was just mentioning about two branches and how in Ezekiel 8 it points out that they're bowing to Tammuz. And then it also uses a symbol at the end of Ezekiel 8 talking about how they put 
uh, the branch to their nose. And it's, it's this thing of a, like insulting the branch, right? And so it's this whole concept of there's, they're worshiping the false branch and rejecting the true branch, right? So Ezekiel 8 is showing that concept by all you between two branches that Tim is pointing out. So we have, uh, we have these things with the branch. Uh, it's the symbol of a tree in Isaiah 11. You have the stem, Jesse, the rod, David, and the branch. Now, what Ben wrote in Point Note when he was first receiving light on this concept of the branch, one of the things that he mentioned is what is the difference between a rod and a branch? Mm -hmm. Just literally speaking, if you have a rod and you have a branch, what's the difference? The branch is living right. and has leaves. Yeah. The rod is made out of the branch. Exactly. So a rod is a, a dried out branch, right? It's a dead sick, right? Whereas the branch is living, you know. So this is the message that we talk about, life, right? And life is found in the branch. Even in, in the greater purpose of the zone, people are starting to touch on the purpose. Totally. Totally. And, yeah, there's the track on the back called the greater purpose that anyone can pick up. Um, and it's A.T. Jones wrote it, and it's really about the branch. She's emphasizing about the branch and Jesus under the name of the branch, rebuilding this second anti-typical temple. And it is the greater purpose. Go ahead, Lorna. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, well, in Revelation, Christ says, I am the root and the offspring of Jesse. Was it an interesting concept? Wow. Now, you have in Isaiah 11, just to give a kind of fuller context of this, the, the prophecy itself, um, okay, I have to mention something as far as concepts of prophecy and how it works with tenses. Okay, when we see a prophecy and it's written in a certain text, whether it is something that is, you know, in Hebrew there's kind of two tenses. There's a complete action and there's an incomplete action. The complete, we could equate with past tense. The incomplete is either something that's currently going on and not yet complete or something that is totally in the future, right? So we have these, these ideas. A prophecy, when it is written, it is written in such a way that when the revelation of the prophecy happens, when the understanding of it comes, the tenses will be correct. In other words, when we see this prophecy of um, Isaiah chapter 2, for example, and it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established above all the mountain, et cetera, et cetera. What that showed us is that that prophecy would be revealed before the thing that it speaks of comes to pass. In other words, the prophecies about the premillennial kingdom were revealed in the late 1930s, before it happened, and they're written in future texts. Now, we also know this as Adventists from the statement, the hour of his judgment is come. They did not, that's the first angel's message, they did not correctly understand the first angel's message until it was true, that it can be said it is come. The hour of judgment is come. They didn't understand it until October 22, 1844. Mm -hmm. It is October 22. Yeah. There you go. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, the reason why I mention that in this context is to just get a broader understanding of Isaiah 11, and I hope that I can help to come find what you're saying, Luna. There's, when we read the prophecy, it's written as being future. And we can understand, uh, Ben Roden points out in his studies, at one point at least, that 
the whole symbol of uh, the root, the rod, and the branch is all something future. Future. Now, Jesse, in other words, was a type. David was a type. And the, the branch, in its reality, in its fullness, is something that comes about in the last days. Christ came to earth 2,000 years ago, and he was, in a sense, the branch. But he didn't have that as his name, because he has a new name. Now, what we have as far as that goes, what Ben Roden pointed out, is that these symbols are also a depiction of the movement. The rod is something that people can see as the rod message and movement. And that proceeded from Jesse, the Advent movement. And from that also comes forward the branch, right? So there's also a message and a movement associated with the branch. And the branch is also a name, and we'll be discussing this too, the connection between the new name of Jesus and the new name of the church. But as far as that goes, the part that you're talking about specifically, Lona, is just the, the relation between the, the branch and the root of Jesse. Right. Mm. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. And you know what? For that, we'd have to go back into Ben Roden's studies. He wrote a lot more about that. I don't have it all in my mind at the present time. But, uh, yeah, I'll repeat it. She's just asking, in what way does Jesse represent the Advent movement? So, for that, we could go back into Ben Road to, to, I'm sure, doing a search on the branch hall. We'll pull up different you know, things about that. Uh, but it's one of the things that was being discussed fairly early on after Victor Hawk died because, you know, one of the first things that Ben Roden was writing is things, you know, called what the people are saying. And he was just discussing how they were going around and discussing things among Davidians and how they were seeing that the Davidian leadership under Florence Hall was kind of falling apart and they didn't really know what to do and they didn't know how to answer the questions that they were asking. So these Davidians who were learning the message, they were seeing things like Isaiah 11 and they're like, okay, well, clearly, you know, Hadith kind of talks about Isaiah 11 and the rod and they understood it to mean the movement, and they said, well, wait a second, the rod comes from Jesse, so that must be a symbol of the Adam's church in some way. But then what's this whole branch thing? If those two things are movements, then the branch should be a movement, shouldn't it? And so they're asking these questions, and those under Ponsada weren't able to really answer it, and so they were kind of disappointed and getting restless and trying to figure things out. So... Essentially. <laughs> Essentially. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I want to look at the heat on that too to see if it says his group. Before I answer, I just want to check to see what it says uh, as far as as far as that goes, and then we can discuss it more at uh, one of these other meetings. Yeah. I would like to say that. Yeah. You know, on my mind, I'm but um, literally the tree is in the wall. You know, and, uh, the branches are all right. <coughs> That's the main stock, and then there's also branches every year come out, and I right. just cut it down. Yeah. I cut it down early, like in July, it'll come up again, and I cut it down, and that would be it. Not just that they always, the roots are spread out, and that's what they will grow. Like we should call them branches, right? Yeah. We call them stems. Yeah. But I cut them down, and it's the main stock. Um, you know, we, we're looking at a tree and now that the tree, so the, right. the roots are going to be that which is um, yeah. not seen. Right. So, and the rod would be like the, the trunk. Mm. And then the branch would that would start now, to spread. No, there's, there's actually, mm -hmm. with the but way... Something cut off, right? And right. Then something coming back. And, uh, okay, so just for the young know, folks, we're talking about kind of this, the structure of a tree and how the symbol kind of works and why it is that there is... You know, how is it, how does it work with the, the roots and the rod and the branch? And essentially, just to give a further context to this, and another reason why we know that the perfect fulfillment of all these stages is yet future, is because the reason why 
Notice it, it says, and there shall come for the rod of the stem of Jesse, and branch shall grow out of his roots. Right? Uh, some translate it as a stump, where it says, there shall come for the rod out of the stump of Jesse, which is an interesting thing. Now, it makes sense with the context of the previous chapter. What we have in the previous chapter is the fall of Assyria. Assyria is likened into a forest, and at the end of the chapter, a few verses just before, the trees are cut down. All these trees are cut down who are part of the Assyrians. And then from that, from that cut down tree, there's this one which is in the line of Jesse, representing Adventism. And from that grows a rod and a branch. Right? Actually, but, that, uh, there it says here, hmm. you've got the roots which is low there, but it's even a stem. Right. No, that's what I was mentioning how a uh, number of translations translate stem there, stump. Yeah. Stump of Jesse. So you have the stump and the roots. And so I understand how that is a, it's a very logical translation in connection with the previous verses because you have the cutting down of the forest. And still happening yet future from today. In other words, if this is this is what it's really talking about as far as this prophecy is yeah, when okay, right, yeah. Well, what Tim was saying is so you're saying this is really future from today. And the answer is yes. The the perfect fulfillment of this is future from today because it's talking about the Assyrian force being cut down and all those that are part of that Assyrian force, including Adventism having been cut down to a stump. The roots are still there. There's the stump, but out of that spring forth a rod and a branch, which is the end sign. That's the manifestation of the end sign, as Victor Hawk talks about. The end sign, the you know, the visible king, the invisible king, David and Christ, the branch. Right? So that's kind of a, a little bit of explanation of the branch. I want to go a little bit more explanation of the branch and then we're going to take a quick break for five, ten, fifteen minutes and come back and look at wisdom. All right. So we're for now we saw in Zechariah's vision. And let's just draw the connection again. Okay. We found out from Ellen White that Jesus' new name is a truth that the hundred and forty thousand understand was called the seal. We saw that a type for the time of the sealing of the hundred and forty thousand is found in the days of Zechariah and that building of the temple. Now, we saw that the one to build the temple, according to Zechariah's vision, is the man whose name is the branch. In the days of Zechariah, there was no one who went by the name the branch. Now, what we found in Revelation, and Christ is talking about his new name being given to those who overcome, he says, to him that overcometh, will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. And I will write upon it the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, and I will write upon it my new name. So you see, according to Revelation, Jesus is the one to build the temple. According to Zechariah, the branch, the man whose name is the branch is the one to build the temple. And that's the name that it gives him. So since all the books meet in Revelation, that must be Jesus' new name. Now, just one other thing that we'll look at quickly it talks about the new name one more time in Revelation. And there's a context to it that lets us know, you know, this is the same thing. Revelation chapter 2, verse 17 says, To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden now, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written. Now, some people take that to mean that we own personally receive a white stone with our own new name. But that's not what it says. It says, you'll receive a white stone. You know, overcome to receive a white stone with a new name written. The only other new name it speaks of in Revelation is the new name of Christ. Now, the other question is, where is that? Revelation 2.17, the stone with the name written. Where is that found in the Old Testament? Since all the books of the Bible need that Revelation. So, again, we know that this is part of the season of the 144,000. So, if we go now to Zechariah chapter 3, verse 8, we're going to see something else that is revealing to us 
it is the same thing. We saw the parallel between Revelation 3.12 and Zechariah 6, 12 and 13. Now we're looking at uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 17, and it's parallel found in uh, Zechariah chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. And when I say parallel, I don't mean that it's quoting it. I mean that these are the two connected passages which give us the understanding of the whole. So, Zechariah chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. We talked about this, Lorna mentioned it last night. Behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua, upon one stone, it says here, shall, it's at the all. Upon one stone are seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave the grave thereof, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of the land in one day. So you see, behold my servant, the branch, or behold the stone that I built before God. And then it says, upon one stone are seven eyes, and I will engrave the graving thereof. So we have this stone connected with the branch, right? We have a stone, a white stone in Revelation with a new name written. So we see this concept of the stone connected with the branch. The new name and building the temple in Revelation 3 connected with the branch, building the temple in Zechariah 6. So these are just a few parables, or not parables, but parallels to let us know of Jesus' new name being the branch. So that's why you know, his name now is the branch. And so when we pray to him, we call him by his new name, right? And when we pray in his name, we pray in his new name, the name of the branch. 